All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, so th this, uh, I wanted to talk today about some Transcendent Founder shivs that um, our group and others have developed. And it seems like there's been a lot of discussion already this morning. So hopefully we can address some of the concerns and issues raised already. So as the room is aware, shivs um, in the non-human primate model that encode HIV-1 envelopes can enable more direct testing of strategies that target or engage with HIV-1 OMS. And it's been a goal of the field to develop shivs that encode um, HIV-1 OMS that are minimally adapted. Um, and these can be transmitted founder viruses, other primary uh, viruses of interest from diverse clades and with diverse phenotypes. And the goal is to have both consistent and robust replication throughout all phases of infection as well as on antiretrovirals and also authentically reprodu reproduce HIV-1 pathogenesis um, without having to monkey around too much with the viruses. So the strategy that Hui Li and George Shaw from Penn developed to sort of uh, try to accomplish this is based on both structural and sequence evidence. So um, there is a position within the envelope uh, gene or protein that falls position 375 that falls within a CD4 binding uh, cavity. And if you look at sequences from SIV viruses, from multiple sequences, we can see that there's a diversity of viruses, but they all, or, excuse me, a diversity of residues, but they all tend to be large, hydrophobic, bulky residues. Whereas in HIV viruses, in particular in group N, there's a predominance of serine. And what was found through a whole bunch of in vitro experiments is if you take HIV-1 OMB and you put in one of these more large bulky hydrophobic acid, amino acids, you get much better binding and engagement with rhesus CD4. And it was thought that this could be a single change that could minimally adapt an envelope so that we could have effective um, infection within the rhesus macaque cells and animals. And so this is the basic platform. We use a um, SIV MAX251 transmitted founder backbone. And again, this is 766 that Brandon and George characterized uh, many years ago. Um, and within this backbone, we insert a Rev on BPU cassette that has the envelope gene from whatever sort of HIV-1 you're interested in. And we make a single mutation at position 375. Because the specific residue that works best within each virus is context dependent, the strategy that we've done is we make a, a mixture of six different clones, each representing a different amino acid here. And then we do a, a, a short passage experiment in rhesus macaques to see which one actually grows out in vivo. So for each one of these shivs, you end up with a context dependent um, amino acid that sort of grows out from this mixture and lets us know which one functions and so in this particular situation, it's histidine, and histidine is often seen in particular in clade C viruses to be the most sort of functional uh, amino acid at that position. So with this strategy, we have generated multiple transmitted founder and other primary um, uh, OMB encoding viruses. And these viruses represent a range of different subtypes and a range of different phenotypes that are interesting or unique, including some that um, induce broadly neutralizing antibodies, both in the um, human from, where, from whom they were derived, as well as rhesus macaques that are experimentally infected with these viruses. Um, I think that uh, the thing that is important to recognize, and this has by highlight, been highlighted by both Christina and by Jeff, is that these uh, viruses in our hands have really consistent early viral kinetics. So regardless of the transmission route we use, we can do multiple mucosal routes, we can use IV, et cetera, we see consistent high peaks and early viral kinetics. Um, however, when we look later on, there is quite a bit of variability in the ability of these viruses to maintain ongoing vir uh, virus replication. And some of these viruses really do have relatively high rates of spontaneous control. So um, in addition to, so, so at Penn, we've generated 20 or more TF shivs that are well characterized in small number of animals as well as in vitro. And these are all available for investigators to use. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And all of these, uh, many of these viruses in particular have um, recapitulated a lot of the biology that was shown with the original HIV-1 OMS in terms of the same confirmation, the same neutralization sensitivity, as well as the same host pathogen interactions that led to specific patterns of broadly neutralizing antibody or non-broadly neutralizing antibody induction within that human, 
and then the virus escape patterns that follow. So we do see this really similar and sort of parallel host virus um, interaction in the human and rhesus macaques infected with SHIB bearing these envelopes. So Brandon Keel and his colleagues at NCI undertook a similar sort of process where they looked, uh, they, they, they looked to make a large panel of SHIVs encoding transmitted founder subclade C viruses. Um, so they started with a panel of 20 different um, clade C HIV-1 arms from the Caprisa cohort. They put them into two different backbones, MAC-239 as well as the 766 backbone, which is the same one that we used with the Penn transmitted founder SHIVs. They made pools with six variants each and did um, uh, in vivo experimentation. They sort of they sequenced to see which viruses out, grew out, and they were able to identify multiple um, shivs here that had replication both in vitro and then in vivo. So then they went ahead and they asked what would happen if they put the same 375 mutation into these animals or into these shivs. And what they saw again in a uh, in vitro is that this 375 position mutation enhanced in vitro replication. So in black, we have MAC2, uh, SIV MAC239 as sort of a positive control. And pink is the original serine from the HIV. And you can see that these different amino acids lead to um, better replication within this in vitro system. And the specific uh, mutation that sort of dominated with each uh, SHIV is different from one virus to the next, but in general, we see enhanced replication in vitro. Then they went on to look in vivo, and they also saw enhanced in vivo replication with these um, 375 mutants as compared to wet type, wild type with earlier and higher peaks. They were able to rescue some low replicating viruses to become more infectious. And then when they looked comparing um, wild type and uh, the mutants, the, the mutants would outgrow the wild types in, in individual animals. So they also, Brandon's group also looked to see about another position within OMS that has been characterized by Greg Del Pret and, Hatsiana, uh, and Theodora Hatsiana uh, to also confer enhanced or improved engagement with Rhesus CD4, and that's position 281. And they showed in vitro that if you add the 281 mutation to the wild type backbone, you do see enhanced replication. Um, but when you add both 281 and 375, they were unable to see additive effects. So it seemed to be a little bit of an either or situation. Regardless, um, Brandon has a panel of these uh, minimally adapted transmitted founder clade C viruses, and he, as always, is highly collaborative and willing to give these viruses to whomever would be interested in them. So with, these, with both groups, we have a large group of these minimally adapted TF shivs that are available for sort of challenge viruses, early viral studies. But the question of what do we do about latency and cure research uh, remains. And as was mentioned earlier by Christina, some of these viruses have been used in latency and cure studies, and they oftentimes lead to levels of spontaneous, or to higher rates of spontaneous control or poor viral replication, which is problematic when you're trying to assess different interventions for persistence. So what I want to talk to you very briefly about are some efforts we've had to develop some, to validate and develop some of these viruses to be um, better attuned to latency and cure studies. And so in blue, we have shiv, uh, a, a clade D shiv, which is viral curve is shown there in this mix of lines. Um, we also have a, a clade C shiv, CH848, which we also validated. And then shiv C, CHAVI505, which is shown here in red, we've attempted to adapt this virus in order to make it a little bit more robust in terms of replication and hopefully be a promising reagent moving forward. So briefly to shiv D, and we have, a, um, we have multiple sort of experiments looking prior to antiretrovirals, and then we have a single experiment of six rhesus macaques initially inoculated um, uh, mucosally and then um, IV if they didn't get fully infected. And so these animals were let to, uh, let to have virus replication for between six and 18 months before they were put on antiretrovirals for six months, and then treatment was interrupted, and we saw universal rebound with reasonably good um, uh, post-rebound um, viral loads that sort of matched where they came into treatment interruption. Again, this is a clade D omv. It was a, identified from a, a Ugandan woman acutely infect, infected in 2008. It has, its HIV-1 uh, virus has been well characterized. It's R5 tropic. It does have some enhanced macrophage tropism, which we're digging into and think maybe one of the reasons why it happens to work well in this model. Um, this virus, in addition to this study, is currently being used by multiple investigators in um, experiments with antiretroviral treatment, 
And the results are still ongoing, but I'll just say from one experiment that we have in collaboration with Yerkes, we have 20 animals infected with SHIB-D. Um, 18 of the 20 at four months of infection had um, consistent viral loads with uh, set points around uh, between 10 to the 3 and 10 to the 6. Um, and when these animals were put on antiretrovirals, uh, they suppressed within a matter of a short number of weeks. They've been on antiretrovirals now for six months, and they're actually undergoing treatment interruptions starting on Friday, I believe, previously, last week. So we're looking to see what happens with rebound, um, and we'll be able to have a little bit better sense of the validation of this uh, reagent for, for antiretroviral and cure studies moving forward. So I want to mention another virus, and this is one of the viruses that Christina mentioned, actually. This is this clade C virus with a um, envelope that has a lot of interest because it did go on to generate um, broadly neutralizing antibodies in the human who was initially infected with it. Um, we see pretty good early viral kinetics in this experiment and in others. Um, and after we treated with six months of antiretrovirals, we did see a rebound in four out of the four animals. But as you can see, our post-rebound vi post viral loads are a little more inconsistent, and uh, we didn't see ongoing replication in all of these animals. So this is, uh, I mean, it is what it is, but it's maybe not the best um, virus to be moving forward with um, a study where you're going to be looking at either time to rebound, viral loads post-rebound um, in an intervention and a control setting. So finally, I want to talk about um, SHIV-C, CHAVI-505, or CH-505, which is a virus that has a lot of interest in the vaccine community. Again, this is a virus where the um, initial, the human who was infected initially went on to develop broadly neutralizing antibodies. There are a lot of different vaccine um, approaches that are based on this particular um, virus. And there are, is a lot of use of this virus as a challenge virus in vaccine studies. Um, however, and here I'm showing three different sort of experiments. These two were relatively short term, and we have pretty good early viral kinetics here. Um, slightly lower viral loads here in this particular study. But if we look out many, many weeks, and this is an experiment that went on for about two years, we can see a substantial number of these animals go on to have either spontaneous control or very low levels of viremia. So this is not an ideal virus for long-term um, studies of either ongoing replication and pathogenesis or treatment on ARP. And so our question was, can we minimally adapt this virus to retain some of the antigenic properties or some of the confirmations that are, are, are important and being used in the vaccine development field, but enhance replication a little bit so it could be a little bit more of a robust reagent for later term or latency and cure strategies. So unfor fortunately, we have many, many um, animals who have been infected and then their sequences characterized over a long period of time. And what we were able to do in multiple different cohorts is look through sequence analysis longitudinally and basically identify a signature of mutations that arose in the animals that had higher viral loads <coughs> compared to those that had lower viral loads. And we looked in the animals that we had infected predominantly at Penn, and we identified a pretty consistent signature of between four and six amino acid changes. And then when we talked to collaborators who'd also used this virus, we found very similar results in their higher viral load animals versus lower viral load. So this is sort of um, uh, uh, corroborated in orthogonal studies. We then went on to do a short in vivo passage, look, um, infecting animals with plasma from early time points and asking if these same viruses or same mutations would grow out quickly and would change sort of the viral load set points. And again, we saw enhanced pathogenesis in these animals, and we saw these same mutations arise very quickly. If we look at the specific mutations that arise, they're either, they're one of two things we believe. One, they're reversions to sort of um, consensus forms uh, of group M or sort of clade B viruses, clade C viruses, or they tend to fall in either a CD4 binding site or co-receptor binding site regions, um, and which is something we infer to potentially um, help this, uh, these viruses replicate more efficiently in, a, in rhesus cells. So, we went ahead and looked at the, these different mutations, and we made all the combinations of the mutants that we could in infectious molecular clones. We tested them in vitro replication experiments. And in each one of these different primary donors, the exact order of the mutations is a little bit different in terms of which replicates better. But what was consistent is that our mutants replicated far better than the wild type or transmitted founder virus, which is shown here in these two blue colors in different um, backbones. And so we consistently saw enhanced replication in vitro with these signature viruses. 
So we decided to do another in vivo competition, and so we took eight different variants that seemed to replicate well in vitro. We made equal mixtures of relatively low doses, about 10 nanograms P27 of each of these variants. We inoculated IV in three rhesus macaques, and we followed um, over these initial weeks of infection. Um, so this is our deep sequencing of the virus stack. We have a big chunk of recombinants, but otherwise all of the different variants are um, sort of well represented. Um, and we believe these recombinants are sort of sequencing artifacts, not part of the actual stock. And what you can see at week one and week two and week four in these three animals is that very quickly, one, this sort of lavender or periwinkle virus kind of grows out quickly. And in fact, this purple variant is just a single nucleotide different from here. So by week four, we really have one of these variants that seems to outcompete in all three of these animals. And this is one of the best sort of in vivo replicators as well. So this is sort of the version of the adapted Chavi 505 that we are moving forward with. We went ahead and checked. Um, this is just a representative new panel comparing the um, adapted version and the wild type. They have very similar um, neutralization sensitivities to a range of antibodies, with the exception that one of the changes is made is a switch from the glycan to position of 334 to 332. So we now do have sensitivity to V3 supersite um, BNAB, which is, which is a, a significant difference. But other than that, the neutralization profile looks very um, similar. So right now, we're continuing to sort of validate this particular virus in vivo. We have wild type versus adapted in vivo competition experiments that are ongoing. And then we have at least small scale experiments looking at how this virus performs over a long period of time with um, a long period of um, suppressive antiretrovirals and rebounds planned in the coming months. So to summarize these transmitted founder um, SHIV as reagents, we do think these have an important role in um, experiments who want to directly test um, HIV-1 envelope targeting or engaging strategies. And these minimal or these, these, amino, these uh, adaptations at position 375 and 281 allow for us to put in relatively unperturbed HIV-1 OMS into these viruses and hopefully um, uh, demonstrate uh, efficient replication both in vivo and in vitro. For prevention and early infection studies, there's really a very large panel of these viruses available for investigators. And for sort of later pathogenesis and latency and cure studies, we're optimistic that some of these viruses are promising. And as we continue to get more results in the next 6 to 12 months, we hope to be able to provide these as more sort of robust reagents in the, uh, in the latency and cure world. So with that, I'll say thank you and take any questions. Are there questions for Katie? And, and while people are asking um, Dr. Barr questions, if I can ask the previous speakers to come up to the front for the panel discussion. Hi, beautiful talk. Uh, Steve Bossinger, Emory University. Um, the CH505 uh, virus, has it evolved? Did it follow any of the mutations saw in the original human? Uh, yes. It actually does follow many of the same mutations that follow the same it, within the human. Um, some of them are a little bit different, but many of those were also seen in the human. They're probably having to do uh, both with reversions and with sort of antibody escape patterns. Um, but yeah, they do, they do, there are quite parallel levels of evolution. Jonas Sasha from OHSU. Um, beautiful talk. At what point does it stop being a transmitted founder virus and become something else? You mean after we've adapted it? Correct. Yeah, I, I mean, I think once you make a single change, it's not dogmatically the transmitted founder virus. So these are TF plus the 375 mutation. And then um, at baseline, and then if we're minimally adapting, it's not a TF virus, but it's, it's an attempt to closely reproduce. Yeah, but you're right. And do you see any switch in co-receptor usage? We haven't. Um, and especially in some of these animals where we see like in the CHAVI 505 group, the higher viral load groups, we haven't seen any co-receptor switch in early viruses. In the SHIV-D, um, you know, in, and epidemiologically, we believe there's a more rapid or more prevalent switch to co-receptor switch with D infection. But in the animals that we've seen, even those that progress to really profound sort of CD4 depletion and systemic illness, high viral loads, we haven't seen co-receptor switch yet. But we're always looking for that because it seems like something that makes sense would happen. 
Francois Avenger, uh, New Iberia. The, uh, do you see uh, mutations in genes other than ours? Yeah, we do, um, quite a few. And we've attempted to look specifically with, you know, focused questions, do we see this, do we see this, do we see, you know. Um, in general, we see less sort of um, sick, mutations going to fixation. Um, but one of the things we've done over the past few years is, is sort of in the, you know, some of our shivs now have slightly different backbones because we do see that viruses tend to, you know, handle the incorporation of a HIV-1 envelope a little bit different. So there are mutations outside of envelopes, um, particularly in the bordering region, but then elsewhere there are other mutations. And honestly, we haven't dissected those with nearly the energy that it would take to fully understand them. Uh, Nancy Haygood, OHSU. I um, noticed that your, your Caprisa cohort uh, shivs appeared to have, all of them seem to have very low post-acute viremia. Is that just uh, bad luck, you think, or is there something unusual about Well, that those, are the, those are the viruses that, that Brandon has characterized, and they have a, <laughs> that's Brandon's fault, no. But, <laughs> but uh, the, the viral load curves that I showed were prior to the 375 or the 281 mutation. So that's just taking the envelope and putting it into that backbone and seeing how it replicates. So I believe that the viruses that are now sort of being disseminated and shared as these are, these are you know, clade C, Caprisa, TF, SHIV, um, have different virus loads than the, the graph I put up here. But it's all in um, the O'Brien paper in PLOS pathogens from April, if you're interested. The, the 375 mutation increased their acute replication and probably their set point, although there's probably too few animals to be sure of that. It's the same problem. The set point and the shivs are, are inherently lower. Vefa, yeah. uh, a question. So for people that want to use a shiv uh, to do vaccine studies, it would be very important to know whether, how are they controlled? So do you know what are the, the, the immune responses, whether they are innate or adapted, that are controlling the infection? That's a great question. Um, we have CDA depleted uh, animals who spontaneously control, and you can see virus rebound most of the time in that situation. Um, I don't think that that's obviously just one very minimal exploration into what's going on there. Uh, so we have a lot of work to do to fully characterize it, but it, you could argue that CD8 T cells have a role, potentially. Um, and beyond that, we, you know, our hypothesis is that there's sort of a multiple, a multi, multifactorial relationship between how well this virus replicates and how effective multiple arms of the host immune system are. And it's not going to be a single immune mechanism. Um, because if we can just get the virus replicating a little better, for instance, if you CD8 deplete early in infection, you can have a, a remarkable change in sort of the, out, the outcome of the viral course moving forward. So uh, we think it's probably a complex balance between the virus and the host and not one specific mechanism of control, but we're attempting to dig through that a little bit. And I will say, in response to Jeff Lifton's comments, um, if you would like to use any of these viruses, <laughs> We will clearly define for you how they were generated, <laughs> the, the way the stocks were, you know, their provenance, how they were generated. We will sequence confirm, provide infectivity titers, et cetera. So we are happy to validate all of the um, flaws and, and you know, whatever we know about these viruses for your use. 